Thank you, everyone, for your exceptional patience. I'll tell you, this is not the way I meant to appear before you today. I meant to, like, you know, grab a shower, freshen up, maybe change my shirt, something like this. But as it happens, this is an appropriate shirt for this venue anyway. Yeah, but uh, the, the, the plane had a two and a half hour delay sitting on the tarmac with no air conditioning for a good hour. So that was a bucket of chuckles. Yeah. A nice, a nice roller coaster ride once we got flying because of all the turbulence, which was really, really fun. I was telling the girl next to me to put up her hands and just, just try to enjoy it. Yeah. And then uh, the other beautiful thing was the landing. Normally, when you come in on a plane, you don't bounce. Yeah, and at least you shouldn't have quite such a hard thud. All right, so I trust everyone can hear me okay? All right, thank you guys for coming out. And this is basically just going to be a rant. <laughs> uh, the biggest thing, the biggest issue that I have uh, with creationism is the fact that, it, and I know that other, my peers will have a very different opinion about this. Some of them want to argue that these people are sincere and it's possible to be sincere, but I don't think it's possible to be sincere when you're a pro, when, not when you're doing creationism. So. I became an activist back around Y2K in response to a number of concerted efforts to undermine science education, not just in my state but nationwide. Referred to then as a culture war, it was and is a coalition of apologetics ministries and pseudoscience propaganda mills determined to spread misinformation across all public media, including the classroom, to cause confusion about and rejection of science in an effort that was accidentally, publicly, admittedly intended to promote religious fundamentalism instead, as if that were the default alternative or even qualified as an alternative at all. Understand that although I am an official representative of American atheists and vehemently opposed to religious faith, all of the, every organization attempting to condemn evolution specifically or science in general are all motivated, motivated by religious faith, but this is not a simple dichotomy of us versus them. So when I make reference to them in this presentation, I'm not talking about all Christians or the other half or anything. I'm talking about a specific subset. Uh, the dogmatic zealots that I'm talking about today, for them, this is very much a, a, a matter of faith versus fact. Creationism isn't a universal aspect of religion. It's religious extremism requiring a degree of reality denial and defensive doctrine, a collection of myths and legends which must be believed solely on the basis of their imagined authority, both in lieu of evidence and even in spite of evidence to the contrary. So creationism is at least an objection to evolution, but depending on how they interpret those fables, creationists can also reject astronomy, cosmology, tectonics, geologic history, biochemistry, heliocentricity, geosphericity, and in some cases, science as a whole both in principle and practice. Creationist organizations often publish statements of faith, publicly admitting, as if this were something to be proud of, that they will automatically and thoughtlessly reject without consideration any and all evidence there could ever be against their position. American creationists are usually Christian and believe the Bible is absolutely infallible, the inerrant word of God in all their parts and on all matters of which they speak, history, theology, science, etc. Despite all the obvious errors, absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions therein. Some hail the Bible as the only source of truth in our world and say, let all else be a lie. As if the sacred fables are always absolutely right regardless, and as if reality could ever be wrong when neither of these are even possible. Of course, the reality is that reality is real, by definition, so it can't be wrong regardless. And it still wouldn't be, even if it was an illusion, because that's still our reality. We have to adhere to its rules. But all our religions, certainly, have to be wrong about something somewhere, but none of them can show that they're right about anything anywhere. The truth is what the facts are, what we can show to be true. There is no truth in any religion because none of them can show that they're any more accurate than all the others or that they're even right about whatever they agree on. There is absolutely no indication whatsoever at all that anything supernatural exists outside of our imagination. We've certainly never seen anything magically created 
for example. But we have a long list of facts, things we know and can show to be true of evolution. For example, it is a fact that evolution happens, that biodiversity and complexity do increase, and that both occur naturally only by evolutionary means that alleles vary with increasing distinction in reproductive populations, and that these are accelerated in genetically isolated groups. It is a fact that natural selection, sexual selection, and genetic drift have all been proven to have predictable influence in guiding this variance, that significant mutations do occur and are inherited by descendant groups, and that multiple independent sets of biological markers exist to trace these lineages backward over many generations. It is a fact that mallards are a subset of ducks, which are a subset of birds, which are a subset of dinosaurs, in the same way that humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome animals. That every animal on Earth has relatives either living elsewhere or evident in the fossil record. It is a fact that the collective genome of all animals has been traced to its most basal form, and that those forms are also indicated by comparative morphology, physiology, and embryological development, in addition to a suite of genetic confirmations provided by, a whole, by whole genome sequence comparisons or specific mutations, molecular vestiges, endogenous retroviruses, and so on. So it is not surprising that the National Academy of Science declares evolution to be both a fact and a theory. Although every modern scientific theory is also a fact. Relativity, cell theory, tectonic plate theory, heliosphericity, atomic theory, the germ theory of disease, and the extended evolutionary synthesis are not just theories. They're all objectively verifiable facts within a particular field of study or body of knowledge, which is what a scientific theory is. Creationists habitually misrepresent what a scientific theory is as if it's only a blind guess like their own position is. Because science has a rule that theories can only be disproved, they can't be proved positively. And this demonstrates a few more ways that science works opposite of faith by trying to disprove itself, encouraging skepticism rather than belief, rewarding those who can overturn the status quo, and by allowing the facts to challenge any authority. But the reason no scientific theory has been disproved in more than 100 years is because the criteria has become a bit more strict since 1783, when Antoine Laurent Lavoisier disproved phlogiston theory and replaced it with oxygen theory. Do you all think oxygen is just a theory? Lavoisier didn't think that that was strong enough to be a theory. He considered it only a hypothesis. So what is it now? Oxygen has been effectively proven, so it's a fact within a theory, within the larger chemistry theory. And nowadays, before a hypothesis can graduate to the level of theory, it has to be effectively proven, at least in a colloquial sense, by demonstrating profound uh, predictive and explanative power and by withstanding a substantial battery of critical analysis in peer review. Evolution has done both of these in spades. Not only do its predictions keep coming true without any contradiction ever, while it survives some of the most rig rigorous critical scrutiny that's ever been applied to any theory, it's actually come out more robust and better supported than the theory of gravity. Meanwhile, intelligent design creationism meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. It has no explanative power because magic doesn't explain anything. It has no supportive evidence, no model of any kind, no testable hypotheses, no natural laws or equivalent alternatives for the supernatural, which doesn't have any evident reality either, and it offers absolutely nothing to the sum of human understanding of anything that is real. An emotional crutch, not unlike an addictive drug, is the most some people can get out of that. Creationists will not admit what a scientific theory is because they're okay with not having evidence for their belief as long as they can all ignore all the evidence that proves that they're wrong. So they will never propose a testable hypothesis that could potentially falsify their belief system the way every theory in science always does. The only value any information can have is however accurate we can show it to be, because only accurate information has practical application. But if you can't show that it is accurate at all, then it has no value at all. 
And that's why every sermon from every theologian and all the fables and all the scriptures are baseless and thus worthless rambling, however entertaining they may be as fictional folklore. It is dishonest to assert empty, unsupported speculation as if it were a matter of verifiable fact, yet that's what all religions do. Faith is just the auto-deceptive practice of making up facts that aren't facts and pretending to know things no one even can know. In any other application, this would be called talking out of your ass. But in religion, it's referred to as revealed truth. Even though every postulation from any religion is either not evidently true or is evidently not true, faith refuses to admit that either, making the making it the most dishonest position it is possible to have. Understand that unsupported assertions have no more validity than claims that have already been proven wrong. So if you can't show that you're right, you're not. There's no benefit of the doubt, there's just doubt. You have to provide a reason to believe you. If you don't have any evidence, there's literally nothing to talk about. Science is only concerned with what is supported by evidence and whatever is not supported doesn't warrant serious consideration. Come back when you have something to show, then we'll have something to consider. For this reason, accuracy and accountability are paramount in science where these things don't seem to matter at all in religion. Science works where religion doesn't because science is the antithesis of faith and deals with knowledge rather than belief because every postulation must be based on prior evidence already indicating that conclusion. Otherwise, they would have no determinable reality and may be indistinguishable from the illusions of delusion. It doesn't matter what you believe. All that matters is why you believe it. What is your evidence? Because only that will determine whether I should believe it too. Otherwise, as Christopher Hitchens said, what can be asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. And Pascal's wager is invalid as well, as he surely discovered when he died and appeared before Allah and was punished for believing in the wrong God or the wrong version of God. Or he might have been reincarnated as a cow and I ate him <laughs> with a ghost pepper marinade. It was great. Or his life force was absorbed back into the biosphere of Gaia of course, the only actual possibility is that he died and stayed dead. Be as open-minded as you like. Entertain any possibility that actually is possible, but don't let yourself be fooled into believing things you can't objectively verify. You can't just say that anything is possible either because there's many things that are not possible unless you live in cartoon land. Before a scientist can say whether something is possible, there must be some precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such a possibility exists. If you don't have that, there's literally no possibility. And we don't have that for anything supernatural. Worse than that, there is no mechanism or logic by which supernatural things could exist or do anything miraculous. That's why the words miraculous and supernatural are both synonymous with the word magical. Just because you don't know a scientific explanation doesn't mean it's explained by magic. And just because you believe in the supernatural doesn't mean you can reject the things that we can show to just be natural. Yet, the basis of most creationist arguments seems to be contrasting naturalism with mysticism, as if you have to choose between the two. I've debated many believers who couldn't refute my evidence without rejecting the reality in which they exist. In one debate, on live video, I told my opponent that his position was so weak that the only way he could be right was if reality was wrong. And so he would have to argue that our understanding is false or the reality is wrong, some kind of excuse that we don't actually know anything. And within two minutes, he did exactly that. He said, I couldn't prove that I even existed two weeks ago because I could have been created as a brain in a vat and fed false memories. So I congratulated him on doing exactly what I predicted he would do, a false reality. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, a delusion is a persistent false belief that is maintained despite indisputable evidence to the contrary. To falsely claim something even when there is evidence otherwise. What makes these beliefs delusional 
is that they don't change when the person is presented with conflicting information. The beliefs remain fixed even when the facts contradict them. For example, the leading creationist organization, AnswersInGenesis.org, says in their statement of faith, no apparent perceived or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. This organization is led by Ken Ham, who famously debated Bill Nye the Science Guy, and also said in that debate that no amount of proof would ever change his mind. Likewise, Bob Jones University is an evangelical Christian college that defines revealed truth as whatever is revealed in Scripture, regardless whether it has any possible support. Quote, if it is in the Bible, it is already true without requiring additional proof. Unquote. Now, we would correctly recognize that as a fallacy being commonly defined as a mistaken belief, especially one based on an unsound argument, which this certainly is. But a Bob Jones University student textbook on biology defines a fallacy as that which contradicts God's revealed truth, no matter how scientific, how commonly believed, how apparently workable or logical it may seem. So in the upside down world of fundamentalism, fallacy means fact and fact means false and truth means what you cannot show to be true. And I've also heard creationists argue that evidence isn't evident because facts aren't factual or objective because they say facts are only subjective opinions. And this is how religion impedes, retards, or reverses everything. Likewise, we commonly understand a fool to be someone who too readily accepts improbable claims from questionable sources on insufficient evidence. So it's no surprise that the Bible and the Quran both use the opposite definition because those books are used to fool you. Understand that being theist, whether Christian or Muslim or what have you, does not necessarily mean you're a creationist. Creationism requires a rejection of evolutionary science at least or at least the big picture where humans are related to animals as part of nature instead of apart from it. But also, more generally, creationism is an objection to methodological naturalism, which is sometimes referred to as the scientific method. That means they get to ignore all the rules that all, the conclu all conclusions must be verifiable and all hypotheses must be falsifiable, because that means all explanations must be natural as opposed to supernatural or magical. Miracles and magic share the same definition, being the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways which are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics, making them impossible, physically impossible by definition, and thus creation is impossible by definition. Believers want to ignore all the practical realities we can prove and instead posit impractical, irrational, and already disproved assumptions of magical explanations that can't be indicated or vindicated or in any way justified. So even if they were right about something, there'd be no way to know what they were right about or to see what they didn't get right at all. And more importantly, the purpose of science is to improve understanding. And the only way to do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perspective and correct them. You can't do that if you won't admit that there could even be flaws in your perspective that might need correction. And that's why there are uh, so many often violently conflicting denominations within so many distinctly different religions, all claiming to be the absolute truth, when none of them can show that they have any truth to their claims at all. Faith allows you to make up whatever you want to believe for no reason at all, and then look for whatever you think aligns with or supports that, even if you have to misrepresent it, distort it, or fabricate it. It's important to note that evolution is not the hoax that believers say it is, but creationism is a hoax, and they perpetuated an awful lot of criminal frauds to promote that belief. These are more elements of reality denial that I'll explain in a moment. Not every believer is willing to go this far to such extremes. If you move from one faith to another, you often adopt a different collection of man-made mythological theological nonsense. But if you walk away from faith itself, then you no longer shard into different denominations. You follow evidence to, evidence to zero in on the one and only truth that everyone who follows evidence zeroes in on. This is one way of telling which is true and which is not. This is an entirely different and superior way of thinking. 
If you look at perspectives on science and religion on a global scale, you'll see that most Christians are evolutionists, and most evolutionists worldwide are Christian. It used to be that way in America, too. Decades ago, it was that the, the common man understood that science was a objectively verifiable reality, and you'd have to be a fool or delusional to deny that. Yet at the same time, most everyone, accepted, most everyone who accepted science also thought that you have a soul that goes somewhere when you die. This middle of the road position was apparently the mainstream until just the last few decades. Now what's happening is that religion is in a general state of decline, both at home and abroad. Islam is the fastest growing religion, but it is also experiencing attenuation. The Saudi government is complaining about the rise of atheists in their own population, even though they have a, they've imposed a death penalty for disbelief. And this factor isn't accounted for in any statistics that talk about how fast religion is growing because they don't take your name off the roster when you no longer believe. Creation, or Christians like to play the persecution card, bragging that there are Muslim countries where they might be killed for their beliefs. But there are also Muslim countries where Christianity is not illegal and atheism is. And that might get you tortured or killed. So you can die for what you don't believe, which for myself at least means I do believe in truth instead of lies. When I began my activism some 20 years ago, atheists represented less than 10% of the population. The dominant 80% was divided between Catholics and Protestants. More recent polls have shown that both of their numbers have dropped. Let's see, while those who lack any uh, theistic belief are on the rise in every one of these United States. Regardless whether they recognize or realize that that makes them atheist or whether they still call themselves agnostic or whatever, Americans who don't believe in any God now account for a quarter of the population outnumbering Catholics, which I think is amazing. Last week, I saw a new poll implying that we've now climbed to just over a third of the population and that, we, and that the estimated 100 million unbelieving infidels now outnumbers Protestants. But while religion is in decline and atheism is on the rise, creationism is also on the rise. Now, how can both of these statistics be true at the same time? Because in the age of information, you have people who are walking away from faith, which is fine. But you also have people who are objecting to that, re or reacting to that, and walking away from science. And this leads to an increase in creationists, geocentrists, flat earthers, new age spiritual healers, and anti-vaxxers using alternative medicines that aren't at all medicinal. So we're losing that uh, middle of the road position as the division widens between the rational versus the irrational. Understand that a rational perspective is based on and in accordance with reason and logic, but faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against all reason. A rational person has sound reason and is willing to be reasoned with, and we've already seen that doesn't apply to creationists. Years ago, I read a poll of American atheists who were born into religious families and raised Christian. The number one reason they gave for why they lost their faith was they read the Bible. The number two answer was the hypocrisy of the church, which has only gotten a lot worse since then. Scientific understanding was only tertiary, but that's still what I'm most concerned about. Because when we're talking about interpretations of ancient fables that may or may not be literal and may or may not be using prophetic language, then you can swap meanings. So that whenever it says this, it really means that if and when the Spirit moves you or on alternating Thursday mornings. And so there's no reason to believe that any of that is real or true. But when the scriptures comment on science, like when it says that if cattle mate while looking at a striped stick, they will bear striped calves, then we can say decisively that the Bible got that wrong because it was written by people who had no idea about genetics. The idea that you either have to make uh, you either have to make believe in the absolute authority and accuracy of the sacred fables, or you have to reject God in order to understand and accept science. It's not only a lo the logical fallacy of the false dichotomy, it's also the very first foundational falsehood of creationism, which of course is my book, which is back there on the table. In fact, the phrase Big Bang to describe cosmic inflation was first coined by a Christian.
Evidence of deep time, the different strata in the geologic column, genetics as an evolutionary matrix, and even the first mechanisms of evolution itself were all discovered by Christians. The laws of thermodynamics were devised by a 19th century proponent of intelligent design who also said that he had no scientific argument against Darwin's theory, and he also maintained that thermodynamics demand that the Earth be at least tens of millions of years old. Many of the historic pioneers of evolutionary science were Christians, and the best champions of evolution are Christian, like the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky, who famously said that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of, of evolution. We're talking about mainstream, peer-reviewed professional scientists, evolutionary biologists and paleontologists, geneticists, geologists, cosmologists, and so on, who accept evolution and reject creationism even though they still believe in the God of the Bible. The point is that none of these scientists are arguing naturalism versus mysticism, which is what creationists want this to all be about. Theistic evolutionists understand the science well enough to know that whether God exists or not, evolution is still an inescapable fact of population genetics. And not even the existence of God can change that or make the Bible turn out to be true anymore. We know it's not and still wouldn't be even if God was real. Most of these theistic evolutionists, like my Christian genetics professor, understand that much of, gen of Genesis is folklore. However, some of these theistic evolutionists hold traditional Christian beliefs, though they obviously have to interpret the Bible different than literalists do. For example, Professor Kenneth Miller, PhD, is literally a textbook evolutionist. Being a cell biologist who co-authored the Prentice Hall textbook on biology with marine biologist Joseph Levine. He was also the star witness in Kitzmiller versus Dover, wherein he, the court ruled that intelligent design is just creationism under a new name. And in that trial, and in many other public discussions available on video, Miller has formally refuted every one of the arguments for irreducible complexity, and he has opposed intelligent design creationists in several venues, yet he identifies as a traditional Catholic himself. Likewise, paleontologist Robert T. Bacher has two PhDs, one from Harvard and one from Johns Hopkins, so he has serious credentials, and he was a consultant on Jurassic Park, the first one. Yet, Reverend Bacher is also an ordained Pentecostal preacher who says that to treat the Bible as though it were common history is to degrade its eternal meaning. Once backed into a corner, biblical literalists can be forced to admit that much of the Bible is metaphorical, has to be, parables with a moral, that they're not necessarily actual history and would be de indefensible as such. Such concessions admit logical faults that could cause their entire belief system to collapse. And very often, this belief in their collective mythology and theology is rather similar to an addiction to heroin in that it matters more to them than anything else, even more than their own health, their families, or their collective happiness or success. So they're very careful to avoid any compromise of their obligation to defend doctrinal delusion no matter what. And this is where we get into apologetics. The practice of systematically making up excuses to rationalize or justify flaws in your own position or dismiss and ignore any and all evidence against it. Because we're not talking about any ev honest evaluation of reality or pursuit of truth. It's a desperate desire to make believe something that is not true, and creationism is not and does not like the truth. I'm not saying that there's no honest creationist. I've met a few. And maybe it is that they hold the position that they do because everyone around them does. Maybe they didn't think about it. Maybe they think there must be something to it since everybody they know believes in this. But um, and maybe they're just innocently deceived by the propaganda machine. But sincere believers are easily cured. Once an honest creationist gets into this debate with somebody who knows both sides of the the controversy better than he knows his own alone, he will very quickly face a life-altering choice whether to remain honest or whether to remain creationist, because it is no longer possible to be both. They either admit that there is substantial evidence for evolution and nothing at all for creationism, or they learn to lie about that and justify it in their own minds, because it is not possible to defend creationism honestly.
Professional creationists have to know exactly what lie to tell at what cue, and that's where we get to the foundational falsehoods of creationism. Among the proposed methods of undermining science in the classroom is the idea that we should teach the controversy, except that there is no controversy in science. Less than 1% of all earth and life scientists, that's biologists and geologists, uh, give any credence to Genesis. The 0.14% of scientists who do believe in creation were already indoctrinated into their extreme religion before they got their education and were unwilling or unable to break that addiction. So if 99.44% equals pure, as it does in the silver trade, then evolution is supported by the entire global scientific community, regardless of the, of the religions of the various scientists, if they have one. The next suggestion was that we teach both sides, that we should teach the fantasy along with the reality as if they were somehow comparably equivalent. No, you don't indoctrinate students in my school and I won't educate parishioners in your church. Then they wanted to teach both the strengths and weaknesses of evolution, to be particularly critical of origins sciences more than any other field. And what they mean by that is not to teach evolution at all, but to instead confuse the students with pseudoscience apologetics that are actually factually false and easily disproved. I'm very familiar with those. I made a career out of rebutting them. Ever since I got an internet connection and any communication online at all, I immediately found myself arguing with creationists all day, every day. They were in every discussion board or news group shouting all sorts of, in of insane ravings, and I found it easy enough to show that everything they said was wrong. Pretty soon I realized I was hearing the same dozen or so arguments over and over again. So instead of writing the same long explanation again, like I did for the last few times, I just started keeping them in a word file, you know, cut and paste. <laughs> and, and sometimes I noticed that the guy I was pasting from, the guy I was talking to at that time, is the same guy I'm talking to now. Why are you asking the same question again that I already answered as if you didn't know? For example, they would say that mutations are always harmful, so I'd give my list of beneficial mutations with explanations from peer-reviewed citations, and of course, there's never any admission of error. Instead, they immediately changed the subject to say, we never found the missing link. And I'd say, yes, we did, way back in 1974. And we found hundreds of individuals from that species, as well as dozens of other intermediate leaks in a chronological sequence since then. And these creationists are forbidden to admit that fact. So they dig their heels in and say, there's no transitional species. So I'd paste the academic definition of, with my explanation of citations again, proving that we actually do have hundreds of definite transitions, even according to the strictest definition of that word. But that's only microevolution, they'd say. You need to prove macroevolution. So I'd paste university science curricula explaining what micro and macroevolution are. The mechanisms of population genetics that apply to microevolution, that small scale changes, or excuse me, small scale variation within a species, are exactly the same mechanisms as in macroevolution, which is large scale variations between species at or above the species level. Then they'd say, we'll never see one species evolve into another. So I'd post another list of citations showing that speciation has been already observed and documented. Uh, in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions in the field dozens of times. And once they see that what they thought would never happen before has happened again and again and again, they move the goalposts to say that speciation is somehow part of microevolution, and despite all my academic citations to show that they're wrong, again, as always. Every time there's a new species of fruit fly or fish, they'd say, but it's still a fly. It's still a fish. It didn't turn into something else fundamentally different. Because this level of dogmatism demands that they not understand what they don't want to believe. So they have to misrepresent it, not to confuse their opponents, but to confuse themselves to keep believing what they know can't really be true. And although, although I did debate a couple of people who knew that what they believe is not true. One opponent associated with the Texas Board of Education debated me and said in the debate that he knew that there were transitional species in the fossil record, but that he wanted to teach students that there were none because he said it was important that they believe there are none. So he admitted in the debate that it is okay to lie 
to other people's kids to deliberately mislead and deceive them in order to promote your religious beliefs. Concert pianist Tim Minchin gave the best summary of this that I've ever heard. In his nine minute beat poem called Storm, he says, science adjusts its views based on what's observed. Faith is the denial of observation so that belief can be preserved. Again, it doesn't matter what the truth is, you just gotta believe, even if it's not true. I've often heard believers say that if the Bible or the Quran were not true, that we should believe it anyway, as if that would inspire people to be more moral or ethical, despite all the historic and current evidence that that experiment has failed at a fantastic level. If it didn't work for the clergy from the Pope on down, and we've seen that it doesn't work for Muslim imams or Protestant ministers either, then it's not going to work for you or anyone else. So when creationists demand proof of evolution, they usually ask for something that would actually disprove evolution or violate the laws thereof. For example, um, because evolution is a real working element of biology, there are natural laws that apply to it, like the evolutionary law of monophyly, that one can never grow out of one's ancestry. Evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarity. These tiers of similarity constitute taxonomic clades. Thus, every new genus or species that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were and therefore still belong to all the clades that they did, even if one starts a new one for itself. Uh, evolution never allows for one uh, kind, because there's no such thing as a kind, never allows for one thing to turn into another fundamentally different kind of thing. Yet that deliberate distortion is what the creationists usually demand. And they will not correct themselves when you show that they are wrong. I would rather suffer the momentary embarrassment of having been proven wrong, even in a public forum, than to forever be wrong and never know it because only accurate information has practical application. If your information isn't accurate, then you don't really understand what you think you do, and what's the value in that? But the people I'm talking about today don't value knowledge like I do. They believe in beliefs, so they will often go back to being wrong even if they know they are wrong, and I've heard many admissions to that effect. You know, why can't I believe what I want to believe? These may be what the facts are, but I prefer to believe this, and so on. Uh, or more commonly, they would say, if believing in God is wrong, then I don't want to be right. When I was a kid, anytime someone in my family, a neighbor or an nanny or whoever, saw that I was reading something about dinosaurs and that I believed in millions of years, they would start reprimanding me or interrogating me like some kind of a suspect. And they would start telling me ridiculous things that didn't make any sense to me, certainly not as a little kid, that were intended to cause me to distrust science the way they distrust science. Science can't explain everything, they would say, without admitting that science has already explained everything we actually know. Then they'd bring up what they thought was a gap in our knowledge that scientists couldn't account for. And if I, as a young child, could explain it to them, which I often could, then believers would hit me with pseudoscience apologetics. There were never any citations I could reference, of course, not when I was a child before there was an internet. Just mysterious X-Files sorts of uh, anomalies that some unnamed they had allegedly discovered, and this is all coming from laymen who obviously have no first-hand knowledge or understanding of what they're reporting. For example, they told me that there were millions of mammoths that were flash-frozen all over Siberia. And some of them, supposedly, according to the report, had tropical flora in their mouths, that they were frozen while they're walking. They're eating tropical plants, so they're in a tropical jungle. They have mammoths, as if mammoths lives in sweltering jungles. And they're eating tropical flora, and then suddenly, flash, they're all frozen. Now, this is supposed to disprove evolution. I'm a little kid. I don't understand. How the hell does that even relate to evolution? What's that got to do with anything? If it was even true, which, you know, coming from my family, it usually wasn't. Now, back then, it was impolite to imply that someone might be lying or that they were full of shit. I was taught that an honorable man would never accuse somebody of lying unless you can immediately do two things. You have to prove, one, that what he said is wrong, and two, you have to show that he knew it was wrong when he said it anyway. It's not enough to just show he's wrong, because then it could just be an error and it might be an honest one. 
Right? You had to show that there was an intent to deceive. So if you can't prove both of these things right then and there, then it's kind of like sinking the cue ball along with the eight ball. You lose. If you accuse somebody of lying, you can't even show that what they said is wrong. You're the liar. Right? Especially if you can't make just the, just the first criteria. You know, forget whether he's trying to deceive. If you can't even show that he was wrong in what he said. Yet creationists accuse me of lying all the time when I'm right and I can prove it. Fast forward 20 years or so, we finally get the internet. I looked up the story of the flash flows and mammoths, and I found out what it related to. Of course, my, my family wasn't going to explain this to me because nobody understood what the hell they were reading. It was, a rela it was related to some idea, I think Henry Morris came up with, uh, uh, Walt Brown actually came up with the idea of some hydroplate theory that there's vast oceans under the, the, the continents and that somehow all of the, the continents broke and all this water, steaming hot geysers shot up into the atmosphere and somehow all the steam froze. Siberia <laughs> and nothing else. So Siberia was a tropical jungle until steam and then instant freezing. So we have an instant ice age. There's nothing to back any of this up, of course. There's a whole lot to prove that it's wrong, but that was the argument nonetheless. Even if that were true, that still wouldn't have anything to do with evolution. But worse than that, it turns out there are millions of dead mammoths all over Siberia because they lived there for generations. There are skeletons all over the world. There are skeletons. Only 51 mammoths were fro found frozen with any kind of uh, flesh preservation, and all of them had experienced desiccation, either by starting to rot or by, eating, by, by being eaten by wolves or what have you, after they died and before they froze. So there's not one that was flash frozen while it was walking around. Not one. And there was no tropical flora either. Although, one of them had tulips in its fur. Tulips are more com most commonly associated with Denmark, and anybody that's been to Denmark will know that it's not remotely tropical. So I found out the story they'd fed me more than 40 years ago was total bullshit. But they're still repeating that story. And when I point out what's wrong with that, it doesn't change anything. They don't even stop using the argument, even when they know it's wrong. They keep repeating it anyway, or they just change the subject, as I pointed out before. So in order to convincingly demonstrate how dishonest creationism is, I offer a two-part challenge for believers hoping to defend their position. One, name an evolutionary scientist, uh, some feel that actually has to do with, with uh, evolution directly, who lied in the act of promoting evolution over creation. Uh, give me the name, quote the alleged lie verbatim, and show also how we know that not only that it's wrong, but that he knew it was wrong before he said it anyway. No one has successfully answered that challenge. Second part of the challenge is name a professional creationist who did not lie when promoting creationism or trying to condemn evolution. In this case, just give me the guy's name. I'll bear the burden of proof to find something he said in his argument that we can show is both wrong and that he knew it was wrong when he said it. I've done that again and again and again. I've had people throw out all kinds of names for creationists and it doesn't take me two minutes on YouTube to find, oh, there's pants on fire. Yeah, this, we're gonna talk about this guy. Again, there's never any accountability. There's never any admission that anything was wrong because the issue, the real controversy between creationism and evolution isn't whether you believe in God or not, it's whether, you're willing, whether you care about what the truth is and whether you're willing to lie to yourself and others to pull the wool over your own eyes to believe an irrational fantasy that is not true and has no truth in it. <laughs>